There is a space between reality and fantasy, between light and dark, between rational and irrational. In this space, there are interludes. This interlude is a strange little tale told in two parts from two writers called Blank. You know when you're dreaming, and you know when you're not. My innocence was gone when my mother caught us that summer night. We pretended to be adults, imitating, and not thinking anything of it. There was a special yearning in us to explore each other in ways only grown-ups knew how, to force ourselves out of the stubborn childhood, to do something wild and unimaginable, so that we could tell our friends. That we dared, that we were not afraid. So I stood there while the sun blazed down on me. His hands slid over my skin, damp with sweat from the abuse of the summer. For once, those hands explored something that was not his own body. That is when I heard my mother scream. It was the shock of it that did it. My mother never expected to catch her daughter this way, so adult, and still a child. I only did it to be a grown-up. I really badly wanted to join the world of worry, anxiety, and seriousness. Ever since my father had passed away, I could not find it in myself to smile. I moved my face, but. The joy would not come. It felt like a terrible lie, a distortion I could not keep up. Smile, people told me. Smile, show how happy you are. Children are supposed to be happy, but I despised that. And the more they asked, the more I resisted. It occurred to me then that if I could become an adult. Even if I had to force it, nobody would notice the permanent seriousness that had settled on my face. Nobody would blink an eye at my pout. Chris got into more trouble than I did. My mother called him names I do not care to repeat. His parents were embarrassed and concerned. They eventually took him out of school and moved him to a private one. A place where he had no friends, and nobody knew him or me, or whatever events connected the two of us. I really don't think anyone would really care if they found out. I still remember that blank expression on his face—the same face, but almost not his own. That last time we saw each other, we did not say a thing. My mother was the victim of my behavior, a victim of what I chose to do. I did not fight her on that. After all, she cared for me all on her own. I was ashamed I let her down, but have to admit, there was always that thrill, the enormous addiction that a touch of another can ignite. I never mentioned any of that to her. Since that time, my mother kept her keen eye on me. I was not allowed to have many friends, and eventually settled on just one, Elisa. We spent all our spare time together, and she knew everything about me, the way I knew everything about her. We were both innocent again and completely cut off from everyone else. This pleased my mother, but made me an outcast. Day after day, Elisa and I went to my house together after school, and spent endless hours talking and imagining, making up lives and adventures for one another. I felt I could share all of myself with her, good and bad, shameful and beautiful. We were both serious together. 
frowning like adults, in a hurry to shed childhood and all of its helplessness. I will forever remember the day I had found out my mother's secret. Everything about that morning was ordinary. I got ready for school. I walked down the hall, headed downstairs when there was a noise behind me. I turned. That is when I noticed my mother's door was ajar. It was odd that it was open, because she never liked to be bothered so early in the morning. She was particular like that. My mother did not allow me to see her before she was ready. In all my life, I have never seen her without her makeup. Not even once. She was always a picture of beauty and looked immaculate in her outfits. Her hair beautifully done. My curiosity stirred, and I could not resist. Fueled by rebellion and staying as quiet as I could, I made my way down the hall to my mother's room. I approached the door and peeked in. I could make out the silhouette of my mother sitting in her vanity, her robe elegantly draped around her shoulders. It was a comforting image, seeing her so real and so human with her face still unmade. My eyes searched for a reflection of her image in the mirror. Her... What? What was that? I stared. My breathing got shallow. My heart sank and felt suspended. Artificial. Where was her face? Instead of the usual eyes and a nose, her lips, all I could see was a blank form, an empty space that seemed to spread and grow. I blinked, unable to comprehend, yet I was unable to look away. Instead, I stared ahead in disbelief, not daring to move a muscle, my eyes glaring, piercing. My mother attached an eye to her blank face, her eye, the same one that I remembered so well. It blinked and studied the image of itself in the mirror, as if it was a foreign object. My mother attached an eyebrow next. It rested perfectly right above the eye. Suddenly, the alien, half-blank face became more familiar. I tried to breathe, but it would not come. So I stared while pressure relentlessly built up at my temples. My mother attached her nose with great care, delicately. Using the tips of her two fingers, she smoothed it out at the edges. Then she attached another eye. The familiarity of her face was almost complete. My chest felt heavy, tingling while I gasped, suffocating. I did not dare blink. That is when our eyes met. I stared into her freshly attached eyes as she stared into mine. One of her eyebrows was still missing. Horror gripped me. I could stand it no longer. I ran down the stairs and out the door. The bus had pulled up and I ran inside, not daring to sit until it pulled away and drove past my house. School was a blur. All I could think of was my mother's eyes, the way they stared back at me. For the first time ever, I noticed just how artificial her stare was, how well-constructed was the look of love, the look of sympathy I knew so well. It was horrifying. Kind of reminded me of the look Chris gave me that last time I saw him. The final time. Detached, but familiar. Elisa poked my arm carefully. Are you okay? You've been quiet all day and you're as pale as a sheet. What happened? I could not muster the courage to say it. 
did not know how. I forced out a smile and shook my head, but Elisa knew me too well. Something is wrong, I know it. She refused to drop it. I don't want to go home, I said. Do you think I can stay at your place? Elisa stared at me with great surprise on her face. All throughout our friendship, she had asked me for a sleepover. Again and again, I declined, not wanting to upset my mother. Ever since that incident with Chris, she did not want me gone, wanted to know that I was home, just in the next room, wanted to know that I was safe. But today, the thought of spending a night in my own bed, the thought of that blank face with no features so close to me, I could not do it. Elisa was excited about the sleepover, but I dreaded having to discuss it with my mother. No doubt she would be upset and demand that I go home, but I couldn't go home. I was horrified. Elisa offered to have her mother, Mrs. Stevenson, talk to mine and reassure her that I will be safe and well cared for. I agreed, thankful to skip a conversation with my mother. When we got to Elisa's, the sun was high up and the day hot and sticky. We lounged by the pool, grateful for its refreshing coolness. I almost forgot about my mother. When I went into the house, I saw Mrs. Stevenson clutching the phone. She looked at me sideways. I stopped, somewhat unnerved. Mrs. Stevenson hung up the phone. That was your mom, she said. There was a smile on her face. Something about that smile was so strange. It sent shivers down my spine. I forced a smirk and nodded. Mrs. Stevenson leaned toward me. That frozen smile was still on her face. Stiff and artificial. Don't you worry. Your mom is okay with you staying here tonight. Mrs. Stevenson paused and waited for me to respond. I remained silent. Aren't you happy? She extended her arm and pet my head. I pulled away. Mrs. Stevenson stared, her eyes severe and unblinking. So I forced a smile. Thank you, I said. Elisa emerged on the other side of the glass door, and I left, heading back to the pool. The day was almost gone, but it was still warm and beautiful. No matter how lovely the day was, Mrs. Stevenson's stiff expression was on my mind. No matter how much fun I had, I could not shake it off. So tell me, what is it? Elisa was laying on the floor next to me. There was makeup and clothes, random things spread all around us. I shook my head, but of course I would tell her. How could I not? Well, I started... I hardly trusted my own voice. It sounded so foreign. I continued. I went into my mother's room early this morning. She did not know I was there watching her. So I saw her get ready. Only, well, I think I saw her face with everything gone. My words tumbled out and my heart beat wildly. I expected Elisa to laugh, to be shocked or to call me a liar. But what she said was more surprising to me than ever. You mean like none of her features were there? Yes, I said. Yes, that's right. It was the freakiest thing. Her nose, her eyes... Even her eyebrows were gone. She was just... blank. Elisa did not say anything, only stared at me with a certain look that I never saw before. There was a long pause. Finally, she spoke. 
What's so weird about that? She asked. Doesn't everyone do that? I thought she was joking, which made me mad. It's not funny, I said. It really happened. She nodded. Don't you take it all off at night, too? We stared at each other, but she was serious. My hands turned cold. So, I continued. So you do it too? You take it all off? Your face? Every night? Elisa stared back at me, then jumped on the bed and turned away. This isn't funny. I heard her voice all muffled because of the pillow. Everyone takes their face off. There was a movement in the rustling of sheets. I watched the back of Elisa's head. I saw her hands travel to her face. Then a sound of something. And finally, she placed objects, one by one, on the bedside table next to her. I knew she was serious. I remained on the floor, staring at Elisa's bed. She was waiting for me to climb up there with her and go to sleep. It was a large bed, soft and comfortable, but I could not do that. The idea of her without her features, her face hauntingly blank, terrified me. What was horrible to me was that she did it too. That she was not freaked out by the whole thing. Did that make me a freak? I touched my own face, even pulled on my nose a couple of times. It was part of my face, just like it had always been. A shiver went through me. I closed my eyes and wrapped my arms around me. I was cold and tired, but I did not dare sleep. Instead, I watched the bed and the door. Watch the whole room just in case, just in case. Before I knew it, I was asleep on the floor by myself. I woke up to Mrs. Stevenson's face hovering above me. That cold, artificial smile made me shiver once again. Why didn't you get into bed? You must be so sore. She was smiling. I stood up. What's wrong? I asked with a tinge of panic in my voice. Nothing is wrong, of course. Get dressed. The breakfast is almost ready. Mrs. Stevenson turned to go, just as Elisa entered the room. She was already dressed in her school clothes, and her hair looked neat and well-brushed. You slept in, she said and barely looked at me. There was nothing in Elisa's manner to suggest anything odd happened to her the night before. I got dressed, wondering the whole time if I had dreamt the whole thing up. Did I really see my mother with no features? Did I stare at Elisa as she carefully removed the features off of her face? Could it really have happened? I looked at Elisa now, but she only smiled back in her usual way. At breakfast, all my earlier anxiety receded. I looked at Elisa and her family. They all seemed normal and ordinary. I even felt silly for thinking otherwise, for bringing up blank faces. Mrs. Stevenson caught my eye and smiled. Your mom wanted you to stop by on your way to school, just to make sure you are okay. I looked up at her a little uneasy. Mrs. Stevenson carefully touched a fresh napkin to her lips. Don't worry. You won't be late for school. There's plenty of time. I smiled, but I was on edge again. Thinking about my mother still made my heart sink but I did not argue. After all, I would have to go home eventually. 
I walked toward my house, staring at the outline of it as I slowly approached it. Elisa stayed with her mom, and besides, I did not want her to come in case... In case of what? I had no idea what to expect. As I got closer to my house, I saw the curtain flip in my mother's window, and she came into view, familiar and smiling. At the sight of her so normal and so missed, I felt immense relief, and I smiled back. Then I stopped. In the window of my room, I saw myself standing, staring back at myself on the street. I looked at that person, just like me in every respect, only slightly odd. The girl in the window reached to her face and adjusted her eye. There it was, some carnival version of myself. It was absolutely horrible, because she resembled me so closely. It sent shivers through me. I stood, frozen. All I could do was stare at that unknown person. Me. In the window of my room. There was a noise behind me and I turned. Several dozens of people, most of whom I knew, stood behind me and stared. Their expressions blank. There was something so artificial and menacing in their gaze. Among them, Elisa stood next to Mrs. Stevenson. Her gaze was unsmiling, serious, and relentless. I looked back to the window and met my own gaze, also serious, unsmiling, and really mean. Suddenly, there was a hand on my shoulder, and then everything went blank. Announcing Mind Over Murder, a new true crime podcast. You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Join us each week as we explore new true crime cases, as well as introduce you to experts from a variety of fields in the true crime space. You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. Available on your favorite podcast platform. We find that in these times, everyone needs some time to chill out and relax. That's why we're excited to announce this week's sponsor, Boston Green Health. Boston Green Health is a local provider of CBD products that specializes in oils, topicals, gummies, and edibles. Boston Green Health's plant-based products can provide natural relief and rest for the mind, body, and soul. As one of New England's premier hemp-based companies, They offer a variety of all-natural CBD products that use a blend of locally sourced hemp extract. Visit bostongreenhealth.com for premium CBD oil, a delicious variety of CBD-infused gummies, luxurious handcrafted topicals, and a product line for pets. Podcast listeners can receive 40% off any purchase by using show code STORIES. Boston Green Health takes pride in being New England's most trusted CBD brand. What Chris Remembers I remember the first words words Dean Dean Yardley Yardley said said to me the day I arrived at Harding. Your lips, they're Cupid's bow lips. Has anyone ever told you that? Dean Yardley was round and bald, and older than dirt. 
and I didn't care for the way he was looking at my lips from his side of the wide mahogany desk. It was the way Rebecca looked at my lips sometimes. It was her fault I ended up here. Her idea to take off her crop top and invite me to her bed. And can I tell you a secret? It was worth it. I can still feel her taut, downy skin against my body, that sensation of contact, of warmth, like a transfer of secrets between long-lost friends. I smelled like her lotion for days. Only one in 600 people are born with Cupid's bow lips, Dean Yardley continued. Some believe people with Cupid's bow lips are able to better express their emotions. That is, they're able to transmit their emotions to others more easily because it makes their faces more expressive. You're very lucky. Thank you, I think is what I said. Now, Christopher, he said, you should know that we don't often allow transfers to Harding halfway through a semester, but... My family, I prompted. Yes, well, your family... My old man was an alumnus of Harding, as was his father before him. That made me legacy, kind of thing men like Dean Yardley still got excited about. What Yardley didn't know was that my dad shit-talked Harding all the time, said the only education he got out of the school was learning how to win at Oogie Cookie, a game that he'd never explained to me, but one I eventually sussed out the meaning for, all my own. But when Rebecca's mother had threatened to get the police involved, after finding us together, it was the one chip he could play to keep me out of juvie. Exile. It's funny what parents never know about their children. I suppose the same can be said of what we know about our parents. You'll be a bit behind in pre-calculus, but nothing you can't handle, I'm sure said Dean Yardley. He leaned over and lowered his voice conspiratorially. I'm so glad you're here, he whispered. We all loved your father. Harding was a collection of five identical brick and granite buildings on the windy side of a hill in northern Massachusetts. Three of those buildings were for learning. One was for faculty. The last was a dormitory. I had to share a room with this boy... I only ever knew his last name, Manco. He was Italian and quite tall. He had the bottom bunk. Never said much to me other than a polite hello in the mornings. At lunch in the mess hall, he would sit at a table in the corner with three other boys who never said anything either. I chalked it up to a learning disability. There were four grades at Harding, each with around 50 students. They called the freshmen plebes, and the upperclassmen's motto was, teach the plebes their manners. So for the first few weeks, I had put up with jabs and taunts from a large junior who always smelled like cheese. But he got bored quickly and moved on. The days were long and the nights were longer. I meditated at night. It was something I was trying, some kind of brooding phase. I'd lay back in the top bunk and stare at the ceiling until it became unfocused, and I'd watch my thoughts like balloons in the wind, flitting away from me, undeciphered, skimming out a calm sea. But eventually, my mind would turn again to Rebecca, to living in that memory of her room, the way her freckles became darker against the rose blush over her cheeks. The way her hair, nearly white, was so thin and blonde at its roots, you couldn't really tell where it began. The rough edges of the world had worn away in that bed, and everything I'd seen after was somehow softer. I doubt she thought of me much, or at all. I had the impression that I was a kind of necessary obstacle for her, the price of admission into that fun house of adulthood. I'd been there before, 
and it was quite fun. But sometimes the tickets were awful expensive. And so the days passed at Harding. And the oaks and elms up and down the Connecticut River Valley turned bright colors, and the halls got hot with the radiant heat from the furnace they turned on at the first frost, bringing out the gamey smell of 200 young men in rutting season. I did well in my subjects that semester. I even managed a B in pre-calc. I was supposed to go home for Thanksgiving. I wondered if I'd see her. Rebecca. I wonder if she looked forward to that, too. One night, just before the holiday, I woke up after midnight to the sound of whispers. There was moonlight through the window, and I could see the room in a bluish glow. I lay there listening a moment, trying to make out what was being said. I could tell that one of the voices was Manko. He was in his bed with someone. Their voice was a little deeper. Slowly, so as not to make a noise, I swiveled my head toward the wall mirror that reflected the bottom bunk. My eyes were adjusted to the light now, and I could clearly make out Manko, sitting cross-legged in front of another plebe. I recognized the boy from my astronomy class. His name was Nick Allen. He had curly blonde hair that stuck up on top. This time, when Manko spoke, I could hear him. What do you want? He whispered. Nick considered the question, then answered, Your left eye. I watched as Manko reached up and removed his left eye and handed it over to the boy. My first thought was that I must be dreaming, that this was some kind of night terror full of imagined absurd evil. But you know when you're dreaming, and you know when you're not. As much as I wished otherwise, I was awake, and I had this terrible thought that if either of these boys caught me spying, they would kill me on the spot. And so I watched, silently, too frightened to turn away or even to close my eyes. And Nick put Manko's left eyeball into his mouth and sucked on it, quietly at first and then a bit more vigorously. Just for a minute or so, and then he placed the eye back onto Manko's face. I want your ear, said Manko. Yes, said Nick. He took off his right ear and handed it to my roommate. Manko licked it, caressed it. And while he did, Nick closed his eyes and moaned quietly, one hand over his mouth. I turned away. The bed springs creaked loudly, and then Manko and Nick got quiet for a couple minutes. But then they started up again. And now, even though I didn't want to, I could hear them perfectly. I want your hair. I want your teeth. I didn't sleep that night. Sometime around four in the morning, Nick finally left. Soon, Manka was snoring, satiated. I told myself I hadn't seen what I'd seen. It was too preposterous. A waking dream, some kind of hallucination. But I knew I was a liar. The next morning, I was called out of class. Mrs. Bailey came with a note halfway through American history and walked me across Langen Field to the admin building. The air was crisp, and I could feel for the first time that year that winter was on its way. Dean Yardley was waiting outside by the door, finishing a cigarette. He stamped it out on the cold, wet grass when he saw us approaching. Mrs. Bailey left us and went inside. Let's have a walk, he said. Then he zipped his parka over his chin and started for the cross-country trail that led into a copse of birch trees on the edge of Rankin Pond. The little pebbled gravel crunched under our feet as we made our way through the wood. I had decided that he was going to tell me my mother had died in an accident. 
crashing her car into the Hudson Bay, maybe. It would be suicide, but in a way that gave everyone plausible deniability. I was about out of my mind with dread when he finally said, Your lovely sweater. Do you know what it's made of? Angora? I said. That's right. And do you know what Angora is? No, it's just a word I heard my mother use. Dean Yardley waddled onward. Angora comes from beautiful little bunnies that were bred in Ankara in the 16th and 17th century. Travelers brought them to Paris, where the textile artist fell in love with their soft, cloud-like hair. Now, don't worry. They don't... They don't kill the bunnies. They harvest their fur, the stuff that makes them unique, and then then they let them go on, growing, eating, making more bunnies, more hair. How do they harvest their fur, then, I asked. They put out a dish of their favorite snack. Corn nips, maybe. They put the dish at the end of a wooden paddock, and when the bunny climbs inside, they close the cage around him and let his neck stick out so he can enjoy the treat. And then they pluck out every one of its hairs. Is that painful? Excruciating. But the bunnies live? They do. And for a while, their bodies are a big hairless blank. Then the hair grows back, and in a couple months, they come back for their treats. The wind kicked up off the valley. My sweater was thick and held in my body heat, but I wished I'd brought a jacket. I didn't want to stay out here in the cold with Dean Yardley. I didn't want to listen to any more of his stories. Did something happen? Something back home? It's come to my attention that you've seen things you shouldn't have seen until you were older, he said. Dean Yardley turned his attention to me and fixed me with his eyes, which were the palest blue. I knew then that he meant the incident with Manko and Nick. One of them must have seen me watching and told the Dean. And if that were true, I realized then everything I'd seen really had happened, and I could no longer deny it. I felt a mix of shame and fear wash over me. My first thought, however absurd was that I should apologize to someone. He took me to a bend in the path then, and the tree line disappeared. Before us now was a long slope of bluegrass, and at the bottom, where the path met a stream, was a short, wide outbuilding made of pine board slats. It seems to be happening earlier and earlier, Dean Yardley mused. I didn't know anything about it until I was 17. Now boys are learning at what? Fourteen? Fifteen? It's powerful knowledge, and you're all much too young. What's in the building there? I asked. Treats and paddocks, he whispered. Treats and paddocks. He comes to visit me sometimes. Holidays, mostly. And sometimes I see him on his long constitutionals along the path that leads into town. One of the slats near the back of the warren has a hole. And every four or five days, it's my turn to look and... I tell the others what I can see. On Christmas Day, Dean Yardley brought me a book of prayers. He sat and read to me for an hour near the fire. And the others crept out from their shadowed corners with their blank, sloping heads craned toward the sound of his voice. When he was done, he put his hand on my head. It stayed there a moment too long. He smiled. And those Cupid's bow lips stretched over his face. And I could tell how very happy he was at last. Thank you for listening to Blank, a Stories from the In-Between interlude. Written by James Renner and Pi Rational Writer. Narration by Valerie Bogart and James Renner. Music by David Williams. 
Recorded at Stay Level Recording Studio in Akron, Ohio. Stories from the In Between is a Crawl Space Media production.